about this big new plant up here called the sun. It's 93 million miles away and it's sending down all that electromagnetic energy, some of which is hitting, say, the ocean and creating this process of the water cycle and the evaporation and condensation and coming down as a solid, a liquid vapor in the fog cycle, surface water to the ocean, groundwater, evapotranspiration, and how we connect with the relationship of the water cycle and again the metabolism of the solar fire cycle is pretty fundamental. What's interesting is that the total volume of water on planet water is a fixed amount of water that has been so for pushing about 4.2 billion years. And so the noun of water, the thing of water, is a finite resource. But because it's a cycle, the verb of water is infinite. And that's the funny thing about water cycles and those and life cycles is that there's nouns and there's verbs. If you're trying, I'm engaging in this, the ecological literacy of reading the landscape and the flow in the system. The reality is that sunlight into sugar into soil is the cycle that we need for our salvation. And the fact that life, originally with bacteria, then algae, and then increasingly plants, have figured out how to turn sunlight into sugar into soil, that's one of the great cycles. The photosynthetic cycle is one of the great cycles, where imagine back in 2015, we were exceptional drought, extreme drought, and then how is it that two years later, we're, quote, out of drought? And so this drought and deluge, this weather whiplash, this bipolar, crazy-making scene, which is what all the predictions are for where this planet is headed. And so really what I want to leave you with is the whole notion that we want to receive and recharge and retain and release in a reverential rehydration rev retrofit for a revolution. And that's what I got for you people for today. Thank you very much. Okay, to rehydrate the earth, how do we do it? We increase surface permeability and thereby water infiltration and underground storage. So what we have developed over the last hundred years with our water management strategies is a largely impermeable earth surface where even if it's dirt, it's so compacted, it's so devoid of carbon and air spaces that water will sink into it. So when it rains, we get lots and lots of water runoff, lots of water into the, into the streets, into the storm drains, out into the ocean right away. And the landscape itself, the land, the continent masses are dehydrating. So when you have trees that have access to underground water and they're able to take that water up into their roots, they bring it through their bodies and then they release it through their leaves. So you may be familiar with this term, evapotranspiration. It's a combo term, evaporation, which is just straight up liquid water turning into water vapor, consuming heat as it does that, right? Solar radiation provides the energy for liquid water to turn into water vapor. But then the trees are also breathing, exhaling water out of their leaves. So the undersides of a tree's leaf is full of little holes called stomata. And in order to photosynthesize, they have to open those stomata to take in carbon dioxide, and then they breathe out the oxygen and the water vapor. So if it's too windy, plants will close down those stomata. They will stop photosynthesizing because it's too windy, and they can't afford to lose that much water. I just want to draw your attention in this diagram here that the evaporation that comes off of the ocean is different than the evapotranspiration that comes off of the forest. So this is very raw water vapor that comes out of the ocean. It's pretty clean. The evapotranspiration off of the forest is full of stuff. It's full of pollen and bacteria and little fungal spores and dusts and little bits of decaying organic matter because you have this multi-layered, very complex biological system with all different kinds of organisms living in there. The main technique that I use in my small-scale restoration work is uh, soils and berms and then also just infiltration basins. And these are so easy to put together. So you can see here in the diagram, a little cartoon, not ever how it actually looks, but gives you a really great idea. Like you dig a trench on the level, on the contour, and water runs into it. When you dig through that top layer, you dig through the impermeable blockages that have built up from those broken apart soil particles that then filtered down through the bigger soil particles and formed an impermeable layer, like somewhere between six inches and 18 inches below the soil surface. You break into that. You fill that trench with organic matter. I use a lot of wood chips, anything that came, like any organic debris you can fill these trenches with. You're keeping them cool. You're, you're providing water and organic matter and cool temperatures to a deeper layer of soil where the soil microorganisms can then just go crazy. They have food, they have water, they have shelter, they have what they need. And so this jump starts your whole 
soil microbiota. Climate change is not as global as we'd like to think. It's so much easier as a population to keep it abstract and out there, kind of like the national debt, right? We know it's out there and the numbers are climbing, we know we gotta deal with it, but as an individual, what really can we do? What I would like to convey today is not so much the global climate issue, but how we can make and deal with climate change here in California as a population that will create resiliency and dynamic results absolutely. Pine trees bioaccumulate lead pretty darn well. All plants have the ability to take up nutrients into their system. That's how they get mineralized and that's where our nutrients come from, but not all elements are beneficial to our survival right now. When the ash and the smoke goes up in the air, all those toxins, all those heavy metals are left in the ash. When the rain falls and that ash and that sediment is drawn into our waterways, that water then goes into our streams and tributaries and is left toxic, killing the trout. Now, if you're in this part of California, largely you're drinking water that's coming out of these areas that are burning right now. Luckily, over the years, California has realized that the water that y'all are drinking is largely toxic anyway, and so it's going through a hellacious treatment process. What happens in San Francisco ripples dramatically throughout the West and throughout the United States. We need to change our tone. We need to change the rhetoric. And we need to not blame climate change or flood or drought. We need to acknowledge that each one of us as individuals is either creating resilience or not. We need to acknowledge that if we suffer a terrible drought, it's because we created a landscape that won't take water. If we suffer an incredible flood, it's because we created a landscape that won't take water.